CSS is very powerful. And there's a lot of things that you can do with CSS that you might not have known about. And some of them you probably shouldn't do, but I'm going to show them to you anyway. OK, so one of the things you can do is count. And you probably know about counting already, but I'll go over it anyway. You set a reset on the page, and, and you give it a name of a counter. And then every time, in this case, the example here is the little number two in the bottom left corner, I'm counting the slides. So if you go back one slide uh, with the back button, it goes to one. And if you go next, it goes in order. It counts. Wow. Um, and then you can just use generated content and put the counter on your page. But you can do stuff that you might not necessarily want to do with that, but it's kind of cool. Um, here, uh, unfortunately, it's a little bit below the page. Let me make it a little bit smaller. I'm actually going to count how many invalid entries there are on the page. In the bottom right corner, I'm going to count it up. So if I put a five here, that's valid. I put the number input type, HTML5 uh, form input of number, from five to seven with a step of, of one. So if I put 5.5, it's not valid. It turned pink. And you see it says you have one invalid entry. If I put the letter H, H it's, or G, it's invalid. Y, it's not printing for some reason. And then if I do this, I now have four invalid entries. But when it's a valid email or a valid number, you'll see the counter on the bottom right goes down. One thing to note about uh, generated content is it has to come after. I know this is a face palm thing, like duh. Um, you can't count something if you haven't hit it in the DOM. But that is why the paragraph comes after all the form elements, because it's counting all the form elements before it and incrementing. So that's one of the tricks you can do with counter and with the invalid pseudo class. So there's a bunch of UI pseudo classes. Uh, you probably know most of these. There's a placeholder shown that is coming out and is not yet supported in any browsers that I tested. And one that's been around for a while but is uh, not well understood is default. So default is the default selected element when the page loads. So if you have 15 checkboxes and one is checked, you can actually make, you can actually maintain state with CSS and keep like the label of that one red or something like that by going colon default plus label, so it'll be the label that comes after the default element. Also works for radio buttons and select options, depending on the browser. So the UI selectors are have the same weight as class selectors. So I want to talk a little bit about specificity. Something that a lot of people don't know is that the star, the global selector, has no specificity whatsoever. So the value of it is zero, zero, zero. Elements. P, L, I, and also pseudo elements, like before or after, or selection, have a specificity of 0, point, uh, 0, 0, 0 1. Class selectors, as you already know, are 0, 1, 0. But what you might not know is attribute selectors, UI selectors, uh, any type of colon anything has um, the weight of 0, 1, 0 as well, just like a class selector. And then the pound sign is more powerful and should be used as limited as possible is the specificity of 1-0-0. If you increase your specificity in terms of being more specific, without increasing the specificity as in the terms of the weight, it doesn't actually add weight. So the combinators of greater than, tilde, or plus have no weight. So if you put your UL greater than LI, which is much more specific, but has the exact same specificity before a UL LI with um, just a descendant selector instead of a child selector, you have the same weight. So that's one thing to remember or to just think about. Then we have the negation selector. The negation selector has no weight either. So LI has the same weight as not LI. Those, two, those first two selectors have the same weight of 0, 0, 1. Dot some class has the same weight of not some class. So the not has, does not have any of the weight. What has the weight in terms of that selector is the argument that you put in, um, that you pass to the not uh, function. So if you have questions about specificity, I created this thing called specificity because I used uh, uh, fish and sharks and uh, the BP oil tanker and the nuclear bomb option of important. Because nuclear bomb option of important is my opinion of the use of important. 
don't use it. Why not? So the, the source order, LI text decoration should be overwritten. The underline would normally be written by line through with a cascade because we have the word important. However, it doesn't. All of these three have underline. Now, if I went with more specificity and did Baz, nothing happens because I have the word important. So I'd have to remove the word important. You guys all know this, right? I'm not teaching you anything you don't know. But what I'm trying to do is to give you some options instead of using important. And one of those is to actually repeat the class. I'm not saying this is the best idea ever. If you do use this, comment it out. But a specificity of disabled, disabled, disabled is 030, which is overwritable. So in this, uh, I, I do consultant work, and it, one of our clients, my, one of my clients uses disabled with cursor important. Uh, rather, cursor default important. Now the thing is, disabled is actually something that a lot of developers are going to use, and they don't realize that it's already been declared with an important. So they'll put a P button, and they want to be disabled until something happens, so they will have put disabled, but maybe their disabled means something different. It's just a different color or something. Well, that didn't overwrite anything, and it can't overwrite anything. But if you put disabled, 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 they won't accidentally disable it with this. But if they kind of just put, I was gonna write some bad words. <laughs> this is frustrating, it's less bad. Um, then it will actually work because of the weight. So a lot of people think that you can't overwrite important. And you can't overwrite it with a style attribute, but you can actually overwrite it. So this is a hack to overwrite it, which don't use, but I want you to know that it's possible. So in this case, I did li text, uh, it should be color. Uh, that was a typo. Um, color was white important. And um, now it's not gonna work anymore because I've changed everything and I broke everything. So. Okay, no, it did work. Okay, so what happens here? No, nope, it's not gonna work in this browser. Um, you can actually overwrite any important um, property. If this were, there's m lots of code in the background so that th this example is not working live now, but let's just go back to um, what we had with text decoration for some reason. No, nope. okay, let me just stop messing up. Okay, so. When an, when an element has, uh, when a property value has the word important, you can actually overwrite it by using an animation with the same property. So in this case, if it were working, uh, which it's not because there's too much code in the back end and there was a typo, um, the animation red forwards will attach the keyframe animation of red, which at the 100% keyframe makes it red and then puts it at forwards. And any declaration that is, um, any property value that is set with animation without the keyword important, it's very important to not put the keyword important in your animation, will overwrite an important. Why is it important to not put the keyword important in your animation? Because if you put an important in your animation, that whole line will be ignored. So what we learned from that is that there are a lot of quirks in uh, animation. So one of them I've already told you about is important is ignored in the at keyframes and in the original values. So if you declare it in the original values, the animation will overwrite it as long as importance not there. In your animation name, it is, a, it is an identifier, not a string, so you wanna follow the rules of an identifier. You don't wanna quote it. You don't wanna have, um, start with an integer or a dash dash or dash integer. Um, animations, unlike other CSS properties, are actually applied in the order they are declared. So when you have like a, a background image or a shadow, it's actually written, drawn from back to front. Animations are actually written from front to back. So if you do like a red, green, blue animation, the blue will take precedence and overwrite the two others. If you do not have a zero or 100% uh, value in your keyframe animation, like in the example I had before, it just went directly to 100, it will actually animate from zero to 100%, setting the zero value in its imagination 
as the default values that you had originally set on that property. So in that previous uh, animation would have gone from white to red. Animation iteration count used to have to be integers or the word infinite. You can actually do, a z the default value of iterations is zero. It will still animate in zero seconds and go to the 100% mark. So you can use forwards or backwards or both. Um, and it will still throw an animation start and an animation end. And you can do 0 0.4, you know, and go at 40% through the animation. So the animations do throw events. It shows one animation, at, uh, animation start at the animation start and one at the animation end. And then as many animation iterations as it iterates through. So if you've gotten at least one animation, it will do at least one. If you're infinite, it will throw infinite numbers of animation um, iterations. And one thing people don't understand or don't know very well or don't fully understand is uh, animation timing function. So I'm going to go a little bit into that. Um, steps. When you want to animate a sprite and actually do a character animation, you want to use a sprite and you want to animate using steps and you want to animate using steps end. Because if you divide, so here I have four, four, um, four pictures in my, uh, in my sprite. If I divide it into four, I, it would be at 25%, 50%, 75%, and 100%, or it would be at 0%, 25%, 50%, and 75%. Because when you divide into four, you actually have five numbers. Either the 0% or the 100% or not both, but not both. So end actually makes it start on the 0%, 25, 50, and 75, whereas steps for start would make it go from 25, 50, 75%, and 100. And if you see at the bottom there, you don't actually want it to go to the 100% mark because then you have no image. So another cool thing is cubic bezier. And cubic bezier, um, let me just make this a little bit smaller or... I'm just going to remove a few lines so it all shows up on one page. Cubic Bezier, in this case, a cubic Bezier actually enables you to go beyond the bounding box of your minimum and maximum values. So here I went from 100 to 500 or 500 to 100 rather. And you'll see that I went to about 40 and up to about 700 by changing the cub cubic Bezier. So if I had done a s eight, it would shoot out way further. Um, and if I had done two, it wouldn't go down as much, but if I had done eight positive there, it would go crazy. So you can actually go out of your uh, cubic bezier, out of the box you set, but this is a nice little tool for understanding other, time, other timing functions. So this one's actually going to go, and it's linear. Or you could do ease in. So I want to show you it going outside of the box, but if you don't understand um, cubic beziers, this is a nice little tool to test what it's going to do. Okay, another thing you can do with animation, or not really animation, because this is not CSS animation, this is SVG animation, and because I'm doing a live presentation, it has decided to just animate a teeny bit on that side over there, instead of animating throughout the whole thing, which is what it's supposed to do. Um, Let's just reload the page. There it goes. Okay. Now it's animating. Um, so with SVG, you can actually animate background images. So you can have a background image on your page that is animated. SVGs are, are very cool. They're basically images. You can put them any place where you could put an image on your page. They're animatable. They support at media. And the thing with the at media is that the viewport for, that it's going to be using for, um, you know, like, Minimum width 400, max width 600, is not the viewport of the screen or the browser. It is the viewport of its containing block. Um, it's supported almost everywhere. It supports raster images and it supports data URIs, which is how I came up with this technique called the clown car technique for foreground images. So the clown car technique is a method of putting foreground responsive images in your pages. So I'm just going to show you the white line is the size of the containing block. And this image is going to, there's four images, depending on the size of the box that it finds itself in. So as I get smaller, the image changes all the way down to a tiny little image. Now that's one way of doing it. I did it a different way here, where it basically fills up the whole screen, but only 
using one image and one HTTP request. So normally people don't shrink and grow, so right there I use four HTTP requests, but the actual code uses only one HTTP request. How does it do that? Basically, I've declared inside an object, I put an SVG, and I'm using at media queries to pull in the correct background image. And I'm using either background size of auto or 100%, depending on whether I want to grow like this or not repaint as I do it. And then I'm declaring four images. So here's just an example of one, screen and max width 300 pixels, background image, the small PNG. So as long as the containing block is 300 pixels or less, it will use a small PNG. When it grows, it will use the 600 or the 900 or the, the medium, the big, and the huge. Why is this important? This right here, the way it's done here, is two HTTP requests because you have the SVG and the image. But you can actually do it as, as a data URI. And will only, that way you're including the data URI, so you're not including, um, for the SVG, which is short, it's like this long in your CSS, not even, it's like four lines. Um, and then it's only pulling in the one uh, image that it needs. So that's the clown car technique. Um, another thing I want to show you is uh, support, at support. The browser, um, browsers now have their own modernizer. So here it says this browser, which by the way is the new Firefox developer browser that they just launched like this past week. Um, so I'm testing it out and seeing everything that's broken, like the animation example. Um, so it supports Flex. But if you really want to do something that you probably shouldn't do, you can say, hey, am I on a... There's Modernizer, but this is actually UA sniffing kind of. So with great power comes great responsibility. I'm not saying do this, but you can actually do this. You can browser sniff uh, with CSS. Okay, so how did I actually do this deck? I actually put this uh, styles as a display block. So I did the head in display block and I put a content att editable attribute. So I can edit the CSS and it will show up and that's what's, what's been happening. So basically the head is display block. I hid everything in the head except for the last style block and then I can change it on the fly. This whole deck has no JavaScript in it. So I've been switching slides. Uh, I've done it two ways, and this way is checked. So I have check boxes, and then I say after the input checked, the label, the slide, um, the next slide is input checked, oh wait, actually I'll read from the end to the beginning, which is the slide that comes after the label that is not checked, that comes right after a slide that comes after a label, that comes after an input that is checked. So basically I'm changing checkboxes like we saw how to do earlier. I'm saying stick that in the upper right hand corner. And why is it up in the right hand corner? So I know what I'm going to talk about next, but um, also so that it slides in nicely. And then all the other ones, all the other ones that have been checked are basically right there and they're sitting one on top of the other. So when I hit the next button, which you can't really see, and that was done on purpose, um, the next one's going to come in, and what that tells me is it's the last slide, and that's the end of this talk. But the slides will always be up there, and they will be updated and corrected so that that animation works. So thank you. Thank you.